Hey, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Steve, for the uh, nice introduction. So as Steve said, the subject of my presentation is going to be on the visualization of anatomical imaging data. And I thought I'd start off by, by giving uh, some motivation for why visualization is important in this field, followed by a description of a few of the non-invasive Im imaging modalities that are widely used. And most of my presentation is going to be focused on MRI and specifically on brain imaging, which is uh, the field in which I work predominantly. And I'll review some of the concepts behind visualizing structural images of anatomy, briefly touch on functional MRI, and then describe some of the methods that we use for examining connectivity in the brain using diffusion imaging. And the motivation for visualization is fairly straightforward, I think, especially to the members of the Visby community. We have a very rich source of data that has many biomedical applications. And visualization allows us to do a variety of things, such as diagnosing clinical patients, performing surgical planning, interpreting and disseminating scientific research results, as well as to assess and develop uh, the effects or the results of computational and mathematical approaches for image analysis. So most of you are probably familiar with this image. This is the first non-invasive medical image, and it was, uh, it's an x-ray of the hand of the wife of the discoverer of x-rays, Wilhelm Röntgen. And this is really how it all started. And x-rays form the basis for the first form of 3D tomographic imaging, which is x-ray CT, which was developed in the 70s. And in x-ray CT, you essentially acquire x-rays from multiple angles of the body, and you can reconstruct a 3D image using these. And then at each pixel or voxel in the image, you then have a measure of the radio density. And this radio density is measured on a quantitative scale that allows you to do a variety of nice things for processing and visualization. One of the nice aspects of CT is that it offers very good contrast between bone and soft tissue and has a very large dynamic range. And then additionally, we can use contrast agents uh, based on things such as iodine or barium in order to visualize uh, things such as blood vessels. Now, generally speaking, CT has distinct values for different types of tissues, so we can separate bone from, from soft tissue very easily using intensity thresholds. And we can visualize things using windowing techniques where only a range of intensities are displayed. And because soft tissues have similar absorption properties and thus similar intensities, more elaborate methods are often necessary in order to segment them individually. Now, typically when we visualize CT, we use things such as maximum intensity projections or, or direct volume rendering or surface reconstructions. And I've shown a few examples here of a CT data set rendered in these different ways. Now, usually in, in clinical settings, we often uh, will look at uh, CT or other 3D imaging modalities using multi-planar reconstruction views where we re-slice the data into different cardinal axes with synchronized views. This is an example of a, a commercial system for doing that. And this will often also show uh, rendered views and allow the, the radiologist uh, or person looking at the scans to, to get a really clear picture of what's going on in them. Now, another form of non-invasive imaging is positron emission tomography. And whereas CT is a transmissive form of imaging, uh, PET uses radionuclides that emit positrons. And so a solution with these is injected into the subject that's being scanned. And then as the isotopes decay, they emit photons that are, uh, I'm sorry, they emit uh, positrons that travel a short distance before they're annihilated with electrons producing gamma rays. And then these are collected by a ring of detectors that allow us to reconstruct a 3D image of the spatial concentration of the radio tracer that was used. And so depending on the type of molecule that's been radio labeled, we can image different aspects of metabolic processes. And so, for example, if we want to look at uh, regional glucose uptake, we can use a radio labeled sugar, such as FDG. And there are some other interesting compounds that have been developed more recently to look at amyloid plaques and tangles in, in patients with Alzheimer's. And the image shown here is an example of just that, where you can see uh, where the plaques and tangles have accumulated in the brain of, of a subject uh, with genetic markers for, for Alzheimer's. Now, another form of nuclear medicine is SPECT, which is a, also emissive imaging. In this case, we use radioisotopes that emit gamma rays. And now we only need a single camera that rotates around the subject in order to form a 3D picture. And these are used for a number of applications, including cardiac perfusion. And that's what the example here is showing. 
And in general, PET and SPECT visualization is similar to, to CT. We often use things such as maximum intensity projections and volume renderings, and we can also make time series imaging images for looking at uh, things such as tracer uptake in the body or examining perfusion in, in the heart. And the last thing I want to say about uh, PET and CT is that uh, one of the major advancements in diagnostic imaging was the development of PET CT systems that combine the two into a single gantry. And so this allowed us to get the benefits of both technologies where you have the ability of PET to uh, examine disorders at the molecular level, whereas you also get the ability of CT to really accurately localize anatomy. And so the combination of these has been really successful in terms of clinical diagnosis as a very good example of how important visualization is to image interpretation. So now I'm going to move on to MRI. And so one of the disadvantages of both CT and PET in terms of research uh, studies is that they require exposure to ionizing radiation. So that limits where we can apply the uh, methods. So in contrast to this, the development of uh, <coughs> MRI has provided a way to image and visualize internal structure and function without such exposure. So MRI uses nuclear magnetic resonance to image nuclei of atoms in the subject or the tissue being scanned. And unlike CT, it can provide very good contrast in soft tissues. And in fact, specialized pulse sequences are typically used to, to separate uh, distinct tissues, such as uh, to emphasize white matter and gray matter contrast. So in addition to imaging tissue structure, we can also uh, apply sequences that allow us to image function or patterns of diffusion. So in terms of visualization, many of the basic tools are similar to those that we use in CT and PET, including multiplanar reconstructions and direct volume rendering. And uh, in addition to that, segmentation is another critical aspect in terms of visualizing and an analyzing MRI data. And because there are a number of imaging artifacts that confound us in processing MRI, a great deal of work has, has been undergone, uh, has gone into the development of methods for automatically segmenting structures in MRI, such as the brain and its substructures. And in addition to this, manual methods are often used to identify the features or landmarks for the purpose of comparative studies. And so in this example, I'm showing um, a multiplanar view of an MRI that has been manually labeled into major structures. In this case, the cortex was extracted automatically and then recolored according to the volumetric labeling. And so if we have a way of mapping new data to this individual brain, then we can use this expert labeling in order to have a standard anatomical reference uh, with which we can visualize structure in the new subjects. And similarly, if we are able to map data from multiple subjects to the standard template, then we can make comparisons across groups. And this brings us uh, to the very important area of image registration. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to grab water. Sorry. <coughs> so the process of image registration is a critical step in many aspects of image analysis. And so it's often applied in an intra-subject context where we wish to look at uh, data from the same subject. So we might align a structural scan to functional data, or we might align CT to MRI. Or we may also wish to examine a longitudinal data for a subject, such as tracking the progression of a disease. And with inter-subject registration methods, we can start to look at group effects, such as patterns of gray matter loss, normal aging, or Alzheimer's, for example. And as I alluded to in the previous slide, if we can align the subject MRI with a labeled atlas, then we can achieve an automated, automated labeling. So the images that I'm showing here are an example of a subject being warped to an atlas using an affine transformation followed by a, a nonlinear transformation. And we use visualization to confirm that the results have been aligned. And this is how we typically have uh, performed uh, quality control in our studies. Now in brain imaging, we're often very concerned about the convoluted features of the cortex. And so a number of surface-based registration methods have been developed that match these features across subjects. So in the example shown here, we've taken the hemispheres of a subject and we've modeled them as surface meshes. And then these meshes are mapped to a flat plane. And we look at the curvature 
maps of these cortical surfaces, and we can distort them to match each other. And this gives us a one-to-one -one mapping from the subject to the atlas. And so we can take the labels and convect them across this mapping in order to produce a labeling of the subject. And so this is useful for a variety of studies, such as the analysis of brain activation, where we want to localize function in individuals, particular regions of interest, or in the comparison of cortical anatomy. So once we have a mapping from individuals to a common space, we can perform a variety of statistical comparisons on measures of the individuals. And there have been numerous studies that make use of both volumetric and surface-based approaches to do just that. And the figure that I'm showing here are some results performed by Paul Thompson and colleagues to look at the uh, effects of Alzheimer's disease. And so in the middle row, what you see is an examination of cortical thickness based on MRI measures that visualize areas of significant significant cortical thinning in individuals with mild versus moderate Alzheimer's. And then in the bottom row is a similar mapping that was done with the PET ligand that I mentioned earlier, where you can look at the amyloid load in MRI scans from the same subjects, which are textured across the PETs, uh, where they've textured the PET signals onto the cortex. And so I think what's, what's uh, interesting about this result is that we have two different methods of looking at the same disease, and we see similar patterns of, of cortical thinning uh, in both methods, as well as looking at uh, how this corresponds to pathology data that were uh, uh, analyzed in, in previous studies. So another application of MRI is in the detection of brain function. And MRI is sensitive to, the, to blood flow and the change from oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin, which alters the magnetic properties of blood. And so specialized pulse sequences are often used that can map these changes, allowing us to measure the hemodynamic response, which is related to neural activity. Uh, that didn't update, did it? Sorry. All right, that's better. And so uh, we use these special pulse sequences to map these changes, and then this allows us to perform fMRI experiments where we can then use uh, statistical methods to detect activation. And this is, again, an area where registration is essential because we want to perform group studies. And so once we've mapped these, sorry about that, uh, then we can typically visualize the results using um, uh, standard spaces and surface models, glass brains, and things like that that allow us to then see where the activations are occurring and what kind of networks exist functionally in the brain. So one of the more exciting types of imaging to be developed in recent years is diffusion-weighted imaging. An MRI, water diffusion along the direction of an applied magnetic gradient, will cause a signal decrease. And we can use this to measure aspects of microscopic diffusion of water in tissues. And so one of the clinical applications of this is to look at where um, diffusion has been restricted, such as in the case of a stroke, where the tissues have been disrupted. And so this is an example of the clinical application. In addition to this, we can also apply diffusion imaging to get a much more vivid picture of the structure of the brain, and in particular, the white matter. And this is done, uh, is achieved because white matter contains many nerve fibers. And so because of their organization, we can detect the diffusion among them and then look at the structure. And so what you're seeing here is an example produced from diffusion tensor imaging where we acquire at least six directions of diffusion and use that to reconstruct a, uh, a 2D tensor model at each voxel. And so the image that's shown here is an example of fractional anisotropy, where we're measuring essentially how aspherical the pattern of diffusion is. And so different types of tissue will produce different patterns. In this case, the white matter has a, a very organized structure, and so it shows up very clearly in the image. Now, in addition to this, we can also look at the principal directions of diffusion in the color encoding map. And so what this essentially allows us to do is see the direction where the fibers are traveling. And so now we've encoded uh, blue going inferior superior, green going anterior posterior, and red going left to right. And so this allows us to see structures such as the corpus callosum very clearly in the image. 
and we can get a, a much better picture of the white matter that's in the image. And still, this only displays the information from a single vector of diffusion, so we can use more elaborate visualization techniques, uh, such as displaying the tensors as ellipsoids, and now we can see much more clearly what's going on in these areas and the organization of the white matter tissue, and we can get a clearer picture of what's connected in the brain. And there's also been some very visually appealing work done by people such as Gordon Kindleman uh, to visualize tensors in ways that enhance the perception of structure. And so in, in these examples, uh, he's moved from the tensor model to a superquadric model, which allows us to get a better visual interpretation of how the connectivity in the brain is organized. And as with our other imaging methods, Registration is really essential if we want to perform group analysis or do studies of, of transformation over time in the connectivity of subjects. And so one issue with uh, tensor data is that it requires special processing because we're interested in the organization of these tensors. And if we want to warp tensors from one subject to match another, we have to reorient them as well as move them in position. And so this was an example of a visualization that we produced uh, with our colleagues in order to examine how the registration method worked. And we can see quite clearly that the tensors are rotating and maintaining their shape while at the same time uh, moving in a fluid way as, as per the mathematical model that they used for the registration process. Now the tensor model is very limited in terms of what it can resolve. So nerve fibers may cross in a voxel which presents ambiguities in terms of different determining what the diffusion pattern means. And so if we sample in a lot more than six directions, perhaps 30 to 100 or even more, you can get a much more clear picture of the diffusion pattern. And so this type of imaging, high angular resolution diffusion, diffusion imaging, uh, models the shape of the diffusion pattern in, in uh, much more detail than the, the two-dimensional ellipse. And you can see in the image at the top the visualization allows us to see much more clearly uh, the detail that's in the image. So I wanted to actually show you an example of just how detailed this is. This is one of the, the Hardy images that we produced. And so you can see uh, the complexity of the shapes that we're looking at that show the organization of the white matter in the brain. And I think what's, what's important to, to note here is that we've now moved from originally scalar images to vector images, to spheroid images, to these very complex uh, patterns of diffusion where we can start to see much more clearly what's going on in the brain. And as you can see, we can go through various slices and see uh, oops, uh, quite a bit of structural detail in the image. And so this visualization of Hardy data is also important in the task of verifying that our image registration is accurate because the high dimensionality of Hardy complicates tasks, the task of registration. And so this is an example of a visualization that we did to verify that uh, one of our registration methods was accurately aligning data across subjects. And so you can see uh, this is a resampled data set that was aligned to the first one, and this is an average of 90 subjects that were all aligned. And you, so you can see that the, the major structural detail across the subjects is preserved in the new image, uh, although you do have some loss of the detail, uh, kind of the secondary details of anatomy. But this is a, another example highlighting just how important it is for us to visualize our results in terms of evaluating whether or not our methods are effective. So another area of great interest in diffusion imaging is the identification of fiber tracts in the brain. And we can trace out fiber tracts in a number of different ways. And it's been a very active area of research with a lot of methods developed. One of the more common methods, we essentially start off at this tensor or other uh, pattern of diffusion. And if we step along the principal direction from it, we can then move and try to identify a trajectory that goes through the diffusion pattern to identify what, a fi uh, what the connectivity in the brain is and what the brain fibers look like. And so this is an example of the kind of map that we can get out of the brain of the uh, connectivity in it. And 
can see really quite a tremendous amount of detail in the image. And we have uh, quite a bit of complexity in the brain. You can see uh, many of the major fiber structures. And, and I don't remember exactly how many. I think this is about 50 million triangles or 500 million. It's all pre-rendered, so it's, it's uh, perhaps not as impressive as, as it seems. But the, uh, I think the impressive thing is really the structure that we can get out of the images. And uh, re really quite stunning. No, uh, this this is just static. Uh, it's like a 16k by 16k image, but it's using deep zoom to to go in. So um, this is, that was one aspect of trying to visualize this much data that we're still trying to kind of work out is how you how you represent it all in a in a convenient way to actually interact with it. And so this was this was. Um, one solution to that was to just render it all offline and then put it on the web for our colleagues to look at so they don't have to actually download the entire data set. And uh, so this is actually a pretty effective technology, I thought, for sharing with, with our, our collaborators. But ideally, we'd want to spin it around and do all those things and grab fiber bundles. I, th I think if you reduce if you, you could simplify the data in order to do that. Um, so there are even more complicated forms of diffusion imaging, such as hybrid diffusion imaging or HID. And HID uses multiple Hardy shells that use sequences that are di sensitive to different rates of diffusion. And so the renderings shown here are showing three different images of the same slice of data that are sensitive to different aspects of diffusion. And we're still trying to solve this problem of how we visualize this to get uh, important meaning out of it. And so one thing we're looking at is animating it or perhaps doing uh, uh, transparent shells or, or things like that. So this is one of the open challenges that we're looking at. And so then, uh, Another form of diffusion imaging that is, is even more dense in terms of how much data it uses is diffusion spectral imaging, which is uh, really pioneered by Van Medine. And the image shown here uh, was produced by Van Medine and Patrick Hagman and others. It really shows just how much detail you can get um, out of tractography. And so this example is from uh, the brain of a macaque monkey. I think the scanning on this took about 25 hours to, to perform. So um, it's, it's not necessarily ready yet for, uh, well, there, there are a variety of techniques for improving the, the rate of collection that are currently being undertaken. And I thought this is a nice example to finish up with the tractography on because this was uh, an image that was included in the visual complexity complexion. If this, visual complexity collection that was curated, that's curated by uh, Manuel Lima, our, our first keynote speaker. So I wanted to bring it back to, to the clinical relevance of the work that's being done and describe a little bit about uh, one application of tractography in terms of surgical planning. And so the example that's shown here is from a recent paper by Golby et al. that describes software that they developed using Slicer 3D in order to allow the interactive querying of tractography sets for surgical planning. And so in particular, they were interested in what happens to tracts near lesions, whether they run through them, how far away they are from them, and to what areas of cortex they connect, as well as what other structures are near them. And so this is important in terms of making decisions of where surgical resection might happen. And so in this particular case, they combine data from structural structural, functional, and diffusion studies in order to allow uh, improved de delineation of principal motor and, and somatosensory tracts. And uh, I think this is a, a very practical example of, of where data fusion and the importance of accurate and interactive visualization has a, a real application in terms of uh, making improvements uh, in the case of surgical resection and making it safer and more effective. 
So I, I thought I'd wrap up my talk with a look at some of the brain network research that's been done by Patrick Hagman and colleagues. And what they've done is to develop methods for extracting whole brain structural connectivity networks using DSI and uh, structural image data. And essentially their workflow is to perform structural segmentation of the image to get out mappings of areas of the cortex. And so they parsellate the brain uh, using FreeSurfer and they parcelate it into uh, 66 different anatomical areas. And then this is further parcelated into 1,000 anatomical regions. And then they combine these regions with the tractography maps that they get from the DSI imaging. And so in doing this, they can look at how well connected each brain region is to each other brain region as they get out a brain connectivity network. And then this network can be used uh, for uh, a number of different types of network analysis and, and visualization of how uh, connected the brain is. So I'm going to wrap up there. And I think um, a lot of what I've shown you today shows very clearly just how rapidly biomedical imaging has been evolving and how we have new types of data emerging frequently. And that we have an increased power to make images of anatomy where we can resolve more clearly the structure of the brain and other uh, organs. And what we see now is vastly improved over what we saw, say, 10 or 20 years ago. And really, visualization is extremely critical in, in all of these, in, in a number of areas, such as diagnosis, validation, interpretation, and discovery. And I think probably the biggest ongoing challenge for us as developers is to create tools that will allow investigators to handle this increasing complexity in terms of data size, uh, increases in study population, and then also, importantly, studies that bridge across fields, such as neuroimaging genetics, where we want to look at the effects on genetics on brain structure or um, similar areas. So I'll close there. Thank you for your attention.